everyone, it's Martina here. Today we're starting at the very beginning of every solar story with a question that kicks off the whole journey. Is solar right for my home and my family? That's the core decision that you deserve, a smart, fact-based answer, not a sales pitch. No matter if you live in Dallas, New York, Mexico City, Frankfurt, London, whatever, the first question is always the same. Does solar make economic sense for your home, your family, and your location? And I've spent over a decade in solar and watch hundreds of my, if not thousands of my clients save real money for years. So in this video, I will walk you through the decision step by step. By the end, you will know whether solar deserves your attention right now, or maybe it's smarter to wait. Let's get started. We all need electricity for kitchen lights, air conditioning, EV in the garage. Basically, everything we love runs on electrons. And the more conveniences we add, the more power we use, so your usage and your bill tends to creep up year after year. It basically never stops. We want bigger TVs, a second fridge. How about the hot tub in the backyard? It all adds up over time. On top of that, electric rates have climbed noticeably in the last few years and aren't exactly trending down and a surging new demand for AI centers is pulling additional pressure on the grid, which is expected to result in higher power prices for consumers. So there are two things you can bank on. First, you will always need electricity. And second, the prices of that electricity is not likely to go down. Unlike the stock market, your monthly bill is not an investment. It's an expense. Solar is one of that few ways to turn that expense into an asset that pays you back over time. So that being said, this is important. Not everyone should jump in. Solar makes the most sense when it's tailored to the right situation. For example, if your electric bill averages only $50 to $80 a month, even in the summer, solar probably doesn't pencil out for you. With such low consumption, the payback period, which is ROI on panels, could stretch out to 15 years or even more, which isn't very compelling. Also, keep in mind that incentives program and rate structures can change over time, affecting payback period as well. So you will want to be looking at the most current rules where you live. So how do you check if your home is a good candidate for solar? Let's look at a few key factors. Number one is roof and sunlight. Do you have a clear open roof panel facing south, east, or west? Ample unshaded roof space is a great sign since consistent sunshine means more energy. Modern panels can handle partial shading better than older ones, but if major section of your roof is in the shade for hours every single day, production will drop enough to basically hurt the whole economics of it. The second thing to consider is your HOA. If you have a homeowners association, check the rules early. In many places, for instance, in Texas, an HOA cannot outright ban solar, but they can surely delay it and impose aesthetic requirements. And some will definitely try to make it as hard for you as possible. We've had projects that take months for HOA approval simply because someone on the board does not like solar panels. Now, another thing to consider is utility buyback policy. Not all electric providers treat home solar the same way. On a big sunny day, your panels might make more power than your home is using at the moment, and the extra goes out to the grid and if no battery is involved. And then the big question is, how do they get you credited for that excess energy you sent to them? Best case is true one-to-one -one net metering. You buy at X amount of cents per kilowatt hour, and then they credit excess generation at the same exact rate. Other programs credit your access at a lower rate, and some utilities basically wipe out any leftover credits at the end of a billing cycle or a year. Even if your provider pays less for solar expert than it charges for imports, solar can still be worth it. It just means that you wanna size your system a bit more carefully or consider adding a battery to maximize self-consumption. The key is to learn how your local net metering or buyback rules before you sign a contract with anyone so that you can predict your savings accurately. Now, if you have usable open land on your property, a ground-mounted solar array can be an excellent alternative to a roof install. I actually use both. We have one property with a ground mount and rooftop, and then I have another property that's a 
rental property that I installed an 8.4 kilowatt system for my tenants. Now that setup covers their usage so well that their monthly bill is basically just the utility fixed base charge around $35 to $40 and then the solar takes care of all the rest. It allowed me to charge a simple flat fee for electricity and turn that solar investment into another income stream. Win-win for both landlord and the renter. So what happens when all the stars align? If your average bill is more like $100 or $300 a month, you have unshaded roof space or a spot for a ground mount, your HOA is cooperating, and your utility offers a fair credit for solar, well, congratulations, you're likely a very strong candidate for solar. At that point, it becomes about dialing in the details, choosing the right system size, panel model, inverter type, and deciding whether a battery makes sense for you or not. And this is definitely something I'm going to be posting videos about, sizing, and how to design your system, basically. So make sure to subscribe to the channel so you do not miss those videos coming in the future. Now, North Texas receives abundant sunshine, enabling high energy yields. In fact, a properly oriented solar array in Dallas area can produce roughly 14 to 1500 kilowatt hours per year for every kilowatt installed. Electricity rates do vary by plan and region, but residential prices across the U.S. have indeed been going up over the past few years. And Texas is absolutely no exception. Retail electric rates in Texas climb over 20% just from 2021 to 2023. You do have to check if there are any other incentives from your local utility or local government. Now, as of fall of 2025, federal solar credits are going away due to the new legislation. BBB passed in the summer, basically provided an end date of the residential solar tax credit, making it unavailable for system placed in service after December 31st of 2025. Now, the bottom line is that you should treat incentives as a cherry on top, not a whole sundae. Great if you get them, but make sure that solar investment stands on its own merits as well. Now, let me give you a more concrete personal example. So at our family home, we run a large 26 solar system spread across south and west facing roof planes, as well as a ground mount. And we have zero shade and the system production has been excellent. Early on, our electricity provider offer a true one-to-one -one net metering with Green Mountain Energy and any surplus we sent to the grid during the day, we could basically pull back at night at the exact same rate. For the first few years, our electric bills basically vanished. At one point, we even got a check from the utility provider when they did that, the account true up. Now, then the rules change. The provider imposed a cap on how many credits you can bank and they stopped crediting certain portions of the bill. Instead of crediting the full retail rate, they would basically just credit only the energy charge, not the delivery charges from Encore. And any credits above the cap would basically expire. On paper, those tweaks sound small, but in practice, it was absolutely huge. Under those new rules, if you produce more than you can use in a month, you might end up giving a lot of energy away to the grid for free or very little once you hit that cap. And then when you buy back electricity at night, you're paying the utility delivery fees even for kilowatt hours that you originally sent them for nothing. This was the moment I realized that a home battery could make a lot more sense, store more of our excess energy on site, export less to the grid, and protect the value of what we generate. Now, solar is not a one-size-fits-all product. It's a great investment when it's designed for your numbers. This means you need to know your usage. Pull at least 12 months of your electric bills and understand how many kilowatt hours you use, especially in high-demand months. Now, your past usage is the foundation for sizing a solar array correctly. Now, if it's a new build, work with AI on good estimation based on the size of your home, how many AC units you have, what type of life style you lead and also work with a reputable company, they should have plenty of data to pull to help you determine what system size would match your home perfectly. So when might it be smarter to hold off on solar? Basically, if your roof is heavily shaded, your bills are pretty low, or your utility solar credits are so weak that you would need a battery to make it worthwhile. Then considering tackling energy efficiency first and revisiting solar in a couple of years. Boosting your home efficiency will lower your consumption right away and set you up for a smaller, cheaper solar system down the road. 
a quick word about grid reliability and why having your own solar and battery can be a smart resiliency move. So the U.S. electrical grid is currently seeing an unprecedented surge in demand. We're talking the biggest slow growth in decades in some regions, all mostly driven by the boom in AI data centers, new manufacturing facilities, and a broader push to electrify transportation and heating. Now, this strain can lead to higher wholesale power prices and more stress on infrastructure, especially during extreme hot weather. Solar panels on your home can't solve your grid issues by themselves, but having your own source of generation and a battery can definitely soften the impact of grid problems at your house. So if the grid is struggling or electricity prices spike, your solar is producing enough energy for you in real time. And with a battery, you gain the ability to basically keep the lines on during a power outage or when the time of use happens. For those who already have solar or are now seriously considering it, remember the success is all about alignment. The right system size, the right design, and the right expectations. In our own case, with two EVs, pool, two AC units, and a 3,500 square feet house, our 26 kilowatt system paid for itself in roughly six and a half years because the project was designed to match our usage and we initially had a really strong net metering program, which sped it up. Now that is what a correct solar project looks like financially and that is exactly the standard I want for you as well. Thank you guys so much for watching. Do not forget to subscribe to the channel for those further videos and I will see you in my next one. Bye!